of fascist ideolo there, there's ideologies. There's no might about yeah. that. It no, will it, definitely you're saying that. it will, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's an old psychoanalytic dictum that anything that you repress comes back with a vengeance. So, for example, if you pretend that you're not afraid of something, that actually makes you more afraid of it. And it's not a good pathway forward. If you, if you suppress your anger and you lie about it, then all it does is move down into the lower, stay down in the lower reaches of your psyche. As any reasonable developmental psychologist figured out like 70 years ago. What do you think attracts uh, people to your ideas or your book? Well, the, I think there's a couple of things. The first thing is, is that I actually do, it actually does matter to me for what that's worth personally that each person puts their life together. I actually believe that there isn't anything more important that anyone can do and there isn't anything more important that I can facilitate. And it makes sense because I am a clinical psychologist and a professor and if you join those together it's kind of what you'd expect. Do you think there's a misconception that you're against um, equality of opportunity? That there's a misconception that you... I mean, well, your debate... Purpose, purposeful yeah. misconception. Yeah. So, and it's not surprising, you know, because I went after the collectivist leftists pretty hard right from the beginning, and I don't have any regrets about that. But it's perfectly reasonable for them in response to say, well, what if he's an extremist? Because that's one possibility. It happens not to be true, because you could be anywhere except on the extreme left and object to extreme leftist collectivist policies. And the Richard Spencer, I think it's Richard, whoever the white supremacist character is, the ethno-nationalist, um, you know, he's not the least bit happy with me and neither, neither are his followers, and for good reason, because I'm no fan of ethnocentrism on the right any more than I am on the left, and they use a collectivist doctrine as well. They just use it in the opposite manner that the leftist collectivists use it. Like the, the radical right guys think of me as a Jewish shill, for God's sake. You know, and, and there's lots of anti-Semitic comments that are uh, aimed at me on my YouTube channel and so forth. And so that's fine, you know, if, if people are foolish enough to take that tack, well, you know, the, the moral burden is going to fall on them. Sweden's foreign minister, Margot Wallström, said that you should crawl back to the stone you came from. And yeah. she couldn't believe that so many people listened to you. If she had done more than merely read the second-hand opinions of ideologically possessed journalists, then she might have thought, uh, she might have had some second thoughts. I did invite her to one of the lectures so she could come out and find out for herself. But as far as I can tell, she didn't attend. And perhaps she had something better to do. It's certainly possible. But I see no evidence whatsoever that she knew anything at all about what she was talking about. And I would also suggest that someone in her position of authority and, and reputation be somewhat more careful about bandying about uh, casual insults in relationship to people she knows absolutely nothing about. Do you think that says anything about uh, her as a foreign minister or does it say something about your ideas that she, that she said these things? I, mean, I think it has something to do with uh, her being willing to um, make statements without having sufficiently done the difficult task of doing the investigation necessary to justify such things and I would say that when you're in a position that she's in that you're required um, ethically, morally and as a consequence of whatever wisdom you might have developed to be very very careful about what you say and why. Because the notion is, is that there's something intri intrinsically toxic about masculinity that manifests itself in the patriarchal tyranny, which is a set of concepts that I detest completely, and that therefore men have to be radically altered in their essence, starting right from early childhood, or we're going to get more of the same tyrannical structure. And I think that that's ungrateful and one-sided and hateful to, to an extreme that... Um, that is so deep that it's, that it's very, very deep and it doesn't manifest its full malevolent nature on the surface. Which I've actually been able to popularize like mad over the last three months, which is, you know, really mind-boggling. And what Solzhenitsyn did in his genius manner, because he's up there with Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, like, man, that guy, he's a towering intellect and a, a person of spectacular moral force, you know, like 
he put himself on the line for that book. He memorized it when he was in the in the prison camps. It's about it's three volumes that thick, you know. It's like 2,000 pages of someone screaming, the smartest person you've ever met, the wisest person you've ever met, screaming in outrage for 2,000 pages. It's no bloody wonder it's out of print. <laughs> Anyways, what Solzhenitsyn did was take on this claim you often hear the radical leftists make about communism, about Marxism. They say, well, that wasn't real Marxism. It's like, okay, well, how many countries do you need to disprove your thesis? How many millions of people have to die before you might admit that you're wrong? Well, obviously more than 100 million because that's the approximate total. That's probably an underestimate, but we'll be conservative because adding another 10 million doesn't really make that much difference. So Solzhenitsyn took that argument apart, partly in his book Lenin and Zurich, and then partly in the Gulag Archipelago. But groundwork had already been laid for all that by Nietzsche, who knew exactly what was coming in the 20th century, and by Dostoevsky, who wrote a book called The Possessed back in like 1880, where he outlined in painful detail the precise mindset that would produce the Russian Revolution like 30 years later. Amazing. And Tolstoy as well, he, he knew what was coming. It made him suicidal. He wrote in his confession that when that the conflict between the ideas of Russia, the traditional ideas, and the Enlightenment ideas sweeping in from the West, they, they blew his worldview apart, which was traditional religious, blew his worldview apart so badly that he was suicidal at the height of his fame. Tolstoy knew what was going to come too. And so it's not like Solzhenitsyn was the only person who could see this. Orwell knew it. Uh, Malcolm Muggeridge knew it in the 1930s when he was noting that the, the Soviets, given their idea of class guilt, which sounds a lot like white privilege to me, or any other form of racism, they used that doctrine to just round up all the kulaks. They were the productive farmers and shipped them off to Siberia, and then six million Ukrainians starved to death, but, you know, they had too many Ukrainians anyway, so it didn't really matter. So, anyways, back to the postmodern types. Well, you know, this all came was revealed in such painful detail that even the kind of closed-minded ideologue that Norman referred to just quite couldn't, couldn't quite muster up the moral courage to keep beating the same damn drum. So what they did instead, being highly intelligent individuals, was play a game of sleight of hand and transformed these Marxist presuppositions into postmodernism in the 1970s. And the idea basically was, well, the working class isn't going to rise up and crush the bourgeoisie because, first of all, they're getting rich, and that wasn't supposed to happen. And second, well, it sort of seemed to be a catastrophe when that occurred, let's say, in Russia. And so maybe we won't do that anymore because the working class actually isn't buying into this either, which is also a problem. You know, having internalized their own oppression, they wouldn't buy into this, to the global myth of utopia. So maybe it's because they had some sense. It's certainly possible. But anyways... The sleight of hand was, oh, well, fine, we'll just play a different oppressor versus oppressed game, and we'll introduce identity politics. It's like, okay, okay, you're not being oppressed because you're a member of the working class, you're being oppressed because you're a woman, or you're being oppressed because you have an ethnicity that's outside the main paradigm, whatever that might be, um, or it's because of your... Your, your, your sexual preference or your sexual identity, whatever, whatever places you in some manner outside the normative culture. And, you know, the thing is, the postmodern value structure, they certainly don't believe that they have any biological grounding, that there's any such thing as a human being. It's all socially constructed, which is really convenient if what you want to do is be the author of an entirely social constructed u utopia that you can run. And then when the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism, well, what it, if the postmodernists don't care about grand unifying narratives and they don't believe in identity, why in the world are they willing to believe in gender identity and sexual identity and racial identity and ethnic identity? And the answer to that is, well, they can't, but they don't care because coherence isn't on their agenda. And besides that, when push comes to shove, their postmodernism is nested inside a deeper Marxism, and so when the postmodern narrative doesn't suffice, say, to push forward the idea that Western civilization should be overturned, they just revert back to the overarching Marxism and say, well, those people are oppressed, and that's a bad thing. 
It's like you might say, well, you're a postmodernist. It's like you don't believe in any of that. And they say, well, yeah, I'm only a postmodernist this deep, but underneath that there's a Marxism, and I can always rely on that to fill in the gaps, and that's exactly what's happening. So, so that's what's happening, as far as I can tell. And, you know, so why do I believe this? Well, there's a little war going on in our culture. Maybe it's not so little. I put my finger on it, and I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. You know, because, okay, you explain it, man. You explain why, like, three million people have watched the U of T free speech rally, and I think seven million people downloaded the Joe Rogan podcast, and it's like crazy. It's crazy. There was 180 newspaper articles about this. It was news for four months. Why? Who cares what I think? God, I don't even care that much about what I think. <laughs> well, what about Trump? It was interesting listening to Trump's inauguration speech because I detected elements of national socialist thought in it. You know, and, and I'm not being dismissive. I'm seriously not being dismissive. But when you radically activate on the side of the left, you call forth compensatory forces and they're not in your control. And like Trump opened his speech, you just read it, it's, he sounds like a 1950 socialist, you know, he's gonna use the power of the state to bring the industry home, to produce a lot of infrastructure. It's a state business unity with the state in charge. And then at the end of his speech, which is where he stops being a, at least the international kind of socialist, he says, well, borders are really important and so is national identity. And you know, the fact that Trump was elected in the, and that there was such a fight between him and, and the Clintonites, and, and that the Clintonites were playing identity politics instead of speaking for the working class, who then Trump co-opted like he should have. Um, there, there's a war going on there. And then, well, what about Brexit? What's going on there? And what about France with Marine Le Pen? And what about Holland with Wilders? You know, watch it. We're in a chaotic time, and you know, I've got letters from people all over the world who tell me how they can't say what they think. It's like, oh, well, that's not very good. And they're kind of happy with me because maybe they think that I emboldened them in some way, and so good, good for that, hypothetically. And most of the people who wrote me, the overwhelming majority, were reasonable, so I'm pretty happy about that, too. But, and maybe I'm wrong about my damn diagnosis, because, like, what do I know? But I do have this proclivity to get to the bottom of things. And what's at the bottom of this is an ideological war, or philosophical war. It's even deeper than that. It might even be deeper than a philosophical war, which is something that's more like a metaphysical or a theological war. You know, it depends on how far down you look. And the postmodernists know exactly what they're doing. This isn't accidental. Of course you shut down speakers you don't agree with, because you can't have a dialogue with them then anyways, because human beings can't have dialogue. There's no such thing as a human individual. There's no such thing as truth. Here's the postmodern world. It's the Hobbesian nightmare. It's everyone against everyone else, except it's not individuals, it's groups. And you're stuck in your damn group, and it's the only thing about you anyways that's relevant, which is why we might base our hiring on it, for example. And you're oppressed, and even if you don't know it, it's only because you've internalized it, and it's the only thing that's real about you anyways. And <laughs> I can't talk to you because I'm in my own little silo of privileged belief, and besides, we can't use logic because that doesn't exist, and so, you're in a group and I'm in a group and all we can do is have a war. Or we can talk, but we don't get to talk because you can't talk if you're a postmodernist because speech is just chatter. So when it's just chatter that, that supports the people in power, that's how they think. And so the whole world is this little armed war of identity group against identity group against identity group. And you shut down people who don't agree with you because why should you let them talk? It's you don't believe in any of the reasons why you would let someone talk. So this isn't accidental. It's not because they're afraid, although it's also because of that. They hijack, you know, fear. They hijack compassion. They make anyone who, who puts forward an alternative view into a terrorist of ideas and someone who's heartless at the core, which is really incredibly intelligent. It's such a good strategy. It's so devious and brilliant, and it's so effective. Because who, want the, who the hell history, wants to be labeled a deeply materialistic view of history and believe that people were fundamentally motivated by economic uh, motives. Um, I never did buy that because I think one of the problems with that theory is that it doesn't ever answer the question what it is that people value. It takes 
it assumes value implicitly in, and associates that with economic well-being, but that's by no means obvious. It's certainly not psychologically obvious that that's the case, and it's not actually how people behave, by the way, from a psychological perspective. So that's a big problem, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a theory that has at least some hypothetical explanatory power and no shortage of psychological attractiveness. That's certainly the case. So anyways, the basic Marxist idea, as I'm sure most of you know, is that the social world and life itself is a battle between those who have and those who, ha who don't have. And that the reason that those who have have is because they take it from those who do not have. And that that's the most appropriate way to view history itself, I suppose stemming back as far back as you can imagine. And that it's also useful to think that way if you want to conceptualize the proper future, because the proper future would be one in which that essentially unjust division would be eradicated so that everyone would be equal in some fundamental way and so that there wouldn't be an owning class and a working class, let's say. The world's a rough place, you know, and there's no doubt that some people have it better at some times than other people, and some people have it, have lives that are so unbearably tragic that it beggars the imagination and other people seem to float through life with nary a worry, although I think that's also exaggerated because no matter how well off you are economically, you're still not really free from the fundamental tragedies of life, right? Your, your loved ones still get sick and, and struggle through life and you're still subject to aging and, and eventually to death, so um, it's not like even at the upper end of the distribution, you're necessarily protected against the essential tragedy of life. And I also think that that's a, another problem with the Marxist worldview, is that it implicitly makes the case that the cause of human suffering is social injustice. And, and that, that's true in some sense, in that social injustice can amplify suffering, but it's certainly not the cause of suffering. The, the cause of suffering, in some sense, is life itself and its fundamental limitations. And, it's really important to make a distinction between those two things because otherwise you can easily be tempted to assume that you could bring the utopia in if you only adjusted the sociological conditions properly. And there's just no reason to assume that that's a reasonable perspective whatsoever, as far as I can tell. I think it's actually a form of existential cowardice to assume that because it doesn't grapple with the real problem. And the real problem is that, well, the real problem is as religious people have um, stated over and over throughout recorded history is that life itself is, is suffering. And that's a fundamental truth. I mean, it's certainly the truth, for example, that's, well, it's a Buddhist truth, a fundamental Buddhist truth, and it's certainly graphically presented in the idea of the crucifixion. So, and that's a hard pill to swallow. It's a bitter pill, pill to swallow. And it's comforting, I suppose, to think that if you just adjusted society properly, that all that suffering would go away. But uh, there isn't really any evidence that that would occur. Um, now, <clears throat> I read George Orwell when I was a kid, probably about 17. I wrote, wrote, read a book called Road to Wigan Pier, which if you haven't read, I would, I would seriously recommend. It's a, it's a, it's a great book. Um, it's in the same line, in some sense, as Animal Farmer 1984, um, although it's more journalistic. We, Orwell went to this coal mining town in northern, northern UK called Wigan Pier, and documented the lives of the working class coal miners who lived there. And I mean, they, to call their lives difficult, it's like, you're not even scratching the surface, right? I mean, they were old by the time they were 40. Most of them had no teeth by the time they were 30. Uh, they lived in abysmal conditions. And the coal miners themselves, who of course developed black lung quite early in their life, had to crawl through short tunnels, three and a half miles, just to get to their eight hour shift and then, which was, wasn't paid for, the, that was the commute fundamentally. Orwell, who was a rather tall man, said that after 500 yards, he could hardly stand up. And of course, then they had